Funding for the Our Town podcast is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota and the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. This is a KSMQ public television show. I'm your host, Danielle Teal. Very excited to have Audrey Betcher from the Rochester Public Library with us today. We're going to cover some very interesting topics related to the library and their role in the community right now, especially facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Audrey. Hi. Glad so to be here. What was that? Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, I can tell that you are in your home and I'm still in my home. So that means we're still with the abiding by the stay at home order. Um, how are you doing with uh, staying at home? And, and I'm assuming you're working remotely most of the time, if, if all the time. I'm working remotely most of the time. I do sometimes go into the library and I often go over to the day center as well. So there's um, a number of roles that um, I, hats I'm wearing at this time, so, but most of the time I am working from home. Okay, let's talk about your uh, journey to the, the to the library first. You know, what is, what is your background? Um, where did you come from and how did you end up in Rochester? Yeah, actually I grew up in Stewartville, so I, oh. um, yeah, so uh, it, I did leave the, the community for a while. Uh, so initially I went to college up in St. Paul and then I moved to St. Louis to uh, work for a company that automated libraries. It was back in the 80s when lots of libraries were going through that process and I always loved the technology side. So I headed off to St. Louis for about five years and then came back and ran an automation system at Selco, Southeastern Libraries Cooperating. And from there, I came over to the Rochester Public Library and have been there ever since. Okay, so are you a Chiefs fan or a Vikings fan? <laughs> I'm a Vikings fan. <laughs> okay, cool. And I am sort of from Missouri, too. Uh, I okay. live, that's actually where I graduated high school. So what a cool connection. Yeah, yeah. I'm much more of a Twins fan than... than uh, oh, you are. Okay, so you like baseball. I do love baseball. Yeah. Good, good. Um, so, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, prior to everything kind of halting, uh, what would you say the library's place was in the Rochester community? You know, why do the people come to the library? What do they go there for? Sure, and I, I do think there's a lot of reasons that people use the library. We are certainly a community gathering place. I contend that the library is the only place in our community where people from all income levels interact productively, where there's no price of admission. You know, anybody can come. You can stay as long as you want. You don't have to spend money. And you can learn and you can, there's so many things you can do. You can be entertained, you can learn, you can be part of a community conversation. There's so much that happens within a library. And so uh, that has obviously changed with COVID. Um, so we've all, every single organization has had to pivot. And the fact that we're doing this as a podcast, you know, in a, in a video format is so different than what either of us have experienced in the past. And so I think that's been really important that every organization has to kind of refine its role. And, and for us, it's always been about, you know, to, the library is a place where you connect and learn. And we continue to figure out how to do that in this, in this COVID world. So though our doors are closed, there was no way to maintain social distancing when we first, um, uh, when we knew schools were going to be out, there, there was just a lot of um, and the, the stay-at-home order, all of that, and libraries across the country are closed. It's not just locally. So that is a trend we see across the whole country. And so we're having to figure out what our services look like. And then as we respond as a city, we have the, um, the city has, uh, has an emergency operations center. And so the library as part of the city is part of that. And so there are several staff that have different roles within that emergency operations center. And my role within that emergency operations center, I'm the head of a section called Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the city and the county, when we, when we were watching nonprofits close who also could not do social distancing, we knew some of our most vulnerable community members, those experiencing homelessness, 
needed a place. <clears throat> and so the emergency operations center asked me as that section chief to stand up a day center. And so we did that. And so we are, we are working at the Mayo Civic Center providing services to uh, people experiencing homelessness. So we have, uh, we run from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every single day. Uh, we're staffed primarily by city employees. Um, most of them are library employees. And so we're really in a place where, um, you know, we certainly served people who um, are experiencing homelessness before uh, when we were at, in the library building. And so many of the guests that we see at the day center are people we already know. So we have some relationships and we're looking to find that safe place because it really is important, <clears throat> excuse me, that everybody has a safe place. Absolutely. How many, how many people are showing up? needing services? So it varies from day to day, anywhere from our highest, our peak number has been 112. Oh, wow. Is that some of it new or, is, or what's the base number that's kind of regular and then the new, the difference in the new? I think that's a really hard number to be able okay. to in our community. Um, what's, but, but here's what's been really wonderful about this experience is the warming center that runs from 8 p.m. to, to 8 a.m. Mm -hmm also moved into the Mayo Civic Center. And so we have ha has been as able to establish closer partnerships with Olmstead County um, and Catholic Charities. So what's happening is we're having social workers at come over to the Mayo Civic Center and we're seeing, we're doing some telehealth. Um, and so we're also, we have us all have housing experts who are coming in, some uh, specialists from the county who are providing services to our guests. And so that's been really wonderful because it's it's a time that um, there are many people who do need services and who are vul very vulnerable who now have the option to uh, talk directly to people who can provide some help. So, what do you find the most partnership? What do you find is the most uh, needed right now to support those that are coming for these services? What is what is the most need? Well, we are providing food st stability. Um, so one of the things that we're doing as part of the day center is we are providing three meals a day. So, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, we're providing uh, breakfast and dinner. We're partnering with community organizations to provide the noon meal. Okay. And a number of very generous uh, donors who have provided some of the evening meals as well. So again, it's a collaboration of community partners, Salvation Army, local churches have all been fabulous to work with uh, Channel One. Um, is where we source our food. So all of that has been a uh, great community partnership coming together. So with each person, you know, the challenges are, are different and that's what's great about having the social workers in the building. Yeah, it sounds like having an integrated uh, collaborative approach has really been beneficial. Do you think some of the, uh, this kind of um, system or hub that you all have put together will moving forward uh, perhaps change how you all work um, in, in kind of an interconnected dynamic. I absolutely think you're going to see system change from this. There's going to be nothing, there's no organization that's going to be able to just go back to what we were doing. I really don't believe that, even from the short term and even to the long term. I think we've learned that we can do things differently and we have to do different, do things differently. Uh, there, you know, there are conversations happening in the community that we know that with unemployment and other uh, pressures that we have because of the COVID-19, that we're gonna, have, uh, we're gonna have pressures to the system. There's gonna be stresses. We're gonna have fewer resources and we're gonna have more people who need help. And so how do we do that? How do we partner? And though, I'm really pleased to tell you that those conversations are happening. That's and great. I'm really excited about how we can collaborate going forward into the future to create better systems. Um, you know, with, with that, the news just came out today that uh, students will not be going back this school year. Um, is the library providing any type of resource or support to students experiencing hardships and needs access to, let's say, internet or, you know, iPads or textbooks, those sorts of things? Right. So uh, right now we have a, a few options in place um, and more to come. So right now we have access to all of our digital resources for all of our students. 
uh, and community members, everybody can get at, at those at those services. We have moved our Wi-Fi that's in the building closer to the walls so that it extends farther out onto the street. So if you, street. you can park, um, you can park near the library and, and get access to, to our Wi-Fi. That does not solve all the problems with people who do not have access to devices. Um, so that is continues to be a challenge. Uh, part of it is has a lot to do with um, how do you how do you keep things clean. So if I'm using it now and you're using it an hour from now, what are the cleaning procedures and how do we do that? So we have actually been in conversation with the school district on how to extend that because they are also providing Wi-Fi access as well. So we're looking we're in conversations to try and do better because we know devices are a huge issue and we're, we're, we're continuing to work on that. You know, a lot of cities have offered uh, free Wi-Fi citywide. Do you think this builds a case for that given, given the barriers? Um, I don't know that we're, I'm, I'm not in a position to be able to say sure. what, where, what's going to be happening with that, but I, it certainly has shown that there's a gap that we have areas of our community that are not as well served by, um, by internet. And I know that, for example, I know Charter has been able to offer some internet access for those families that need it. Uh, but that's my understanding is that's a shorter term solution. And so I do think we have we have learned that internet access is not a nice to have in in a COVID world. We everybody needs to be connected, and if you can't do it face to face, digitally is how we're doing it. Right, we're so reliant on digital access at this point. Um, I Absolutely. see almost everything that I do currently. So, um, yeah. thank you for sharing that and, and providing some, you know, other options for people to access or look into as well. What is the library currently doing to maintain its business? So, people typically rent physical books. You know, is there are or have you modified kind of how that's offered? I know that you mentioned some digital offerings. Have you expanded right. that? So digital offerings, we definitely ramp that up um, in terms of uh, venturing into uh, programming as well. So normally you would come to the library to have library programming, and now you can do it digitally where we have offered uh, coloring and story times and, and different kinds of meetup groups to, um, for, to keep people connected and can continue to learn. Uh, but I'm happy to announce that we are going to be uh, starting curbside delivery next week. Oh, so that's that great start getting materials again. Um, we have really taken, uh, a, you know, we have really looked at this to try and how do we do it safely? How do we do a non-contact uh, pickup and delivery? Uh, we've been quarantining items. And so we're gonna make sure that that whole process that staff and public are both uh, protected in, in this new world that we're that we're dealing with, so we're we're excited to offer that. We're really really excited to uh, provide that service. We know it'll be well received. Um, and then for those who have absolutely no way of getting to the library, we're working on uh, a delivery system. Um, so that is going to be a little bit slower. We are not going to be your same day or next day delivery system, but we want to make that an option as well for those who have who are not able to come downtown. So both of those options should be available starting next week. What are people most next interested week, in? Late next uh, week. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to swing by the, the library when the curbside is offered. That's yeah. great. Um, what are some um, offerings that people are most interested in that you're just trying to get, keep up with or, or ensure that's available? Yeah, I think um, really the eBooks and e-audio books are hugely popular. It's a way for uh, people to continue to learn and also to be um, entertained and really um, give us a new light on the world. Um, and so keeping up with that has been uh, really important for us because um, as we have not been able to deliver the physical books, it's the way for people to get books into their hands. And so uh, we've continued to purchase um, uh, e-content um, but I also want to stress that, that our other databases are out there as well. So if you're doing consumer reports, if you, uh, some of our vendors have in fact changed some of their licensing agreements to give it, to give us more access. So for example, if you want to do some genealogy research, there was, there was one particular resource that you could only use in the library and they've changed. 
they've uh, now, they now are offering it um, outside the library remotely. So, um, you know, so if you're doing genealogy research, if you're finding time to do that, um, we have resources at the library. Everything from repairing your vehicle to uh, reading the New York Times back to the 1850s, you can you can get material at the library, um, both through the e-content as well as through the databases. Uh, you know, Audrey, I'm going to wager that people are uh, probably getting on loan food cookbooks <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, remodeling uh, books because I see a lot on my social media of people installing flooring or, you know, lots of this wonderful uh, recipes that they're, that they're doing and, and cooking. Right, right. And so. we have a fantastic cooking collection. So uh, we hope people start placing holds on it and start coming to pick them up. That's great. Um, so from a library uh, operations standpoint, mm -hmm. what do you find is the biggest barrier for you right now trying to, um, you know, keep operations going, keep your staff working, those sorts of things? Sure. So the other role that we have taken on in the Emergency Operations Center is we're running a call center. So the COVID line, the one that uh, the 507-328-2, uh, uh, oh my gosh. You put on the spot. It's all good. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, the, the COVID line that the city is, uh, is um, it, the people who are answering that, that call line are librarians and library staff. So that's been fantastic. It's really been an important role for us to make sure that uh, the community has good information. And so we're answering that um, every day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. Um, anybody who calls the library or calls the, the city COVID line will actually get a, get a human being to answer the phone and talk to them and answer questions. We get everything from, you know, can I travel through Minnesota to can I, you know, can I travel what about masks? You know, can I get a mask? Because the, so what happened is we initially just started answering the questions uh, that from the city. We, um, after a period of time, we merged our call centers with the county. So the city and county have a shared call center right now. And so if somebody calls asking for services, we do have, there are people from the county who uh, we escalate that up and people from the county will call people back. And we're now starting to work on the mask distribution. So as people want to donate masks, they can do that at the city fire stations. And then uh, people could also call the call center and say, I need masks or I wanna donate masks or, um, so we're part of that whole integration. So we have a number of staff, you know, when you're running a call center that many hours in a week, we have a number of staff doing that. So they're also answering uh, questions. So if you're having trouble with your device or travel, um, you're struggling to download ebooks, we're happy to take those calls as well and help people um, navigate library resources as well as getting some general information about um, how to operate in our world. Audrey, did you think that as the director of the Rochester Public Library that, that you and your team would be involved in, in, in such a uh, responsive level for the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, it's, it's been really interesting because I, even though I, this is not anything we ever planned for, these, these things are all within our wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. We take phone calls every single day from the public and they can range from any topic from, you know, we don't have a set number of topics. So we're used to handling lots of uh, varied questions and we're used to using digital resources to be able to answer to be able to answer questions. So we have been really working hard to develop, uh, when, when, of course, with many partners, a really vetted list to help answer those questions. So even though this is not something, or running a day center, you know, that was never anything I ever pictured. Um, right, that wasn't in your job description, was it? <laughs> not in my job description, and I, I often joke that one more thing I didn't learn in library school, you know? Right. So, <laughs> I think we're all learning different ways that uh, to contribute in the community. So that absolutely. Is, yeah. But here, here's what I'll say: as I have the most innovative team, I have a team that's so community focused that when the emergency operations center said we need this, we're like, we can do this. We can step up. That's absolutely absolutely what we can do. And so 
I think our work has been really vulnerable or has been really important, especially around vulnerable people. I look at it and I think a lot, I really believe that how a community responds to its most vulnerable says a lot about the community. And so I'm really proud that the city said this is a priority for us and, and we're going to make sure everybody um, has a place. Um, I'm amazed at how collaborative the approach has been, uh, yeah. you know, with the city and you just mentioned the county and, and, yeah. um, you know, the organizations in, in the community as well and, and how integrated that is. Uh, yeah. The library already had some things that were digital. Um, yes. You know, given that platform, how was it moving to almost essentially being fully digital? Was that difficult? Did you have, did you have to add some things? Um, one thing that's been really interesting is we have um, had all of our calls, the people working at the call center are at home. So we had never operated um, so remotely. So, um, and there were some things that happened actually last fall when the library had um, its water leak, then we had a lot of damage. We moved into an emergency operation um, structure while we were dealing with that because nobody was doing regular library work. We were all like getting wet materials out of the building. And so we instituted things like a daily, a daily huddle. And so some of those things that happen in an emergency, we were already used to doing. So that helped us prepare. And because we were, we had gone through a time where we had to pivot, we pivoted again. And I think that's been really um, important about the culture of the library in terms of um, that piece, that innovation and that the ability to really say, what does the community need and uh, do what, what the community says is most important first um, and, and just figure it out. I mean, that's the thing I love about my team. I have a team of people who will just figure it out. And, um, and that's what's been really fun as we've been uh, working on things. But we now have a daily huddle and it's just always, it's now done digitally. We do it, um, we do it in Microsoft Teams and every day we talk about what's happening and what we need and how, we're, how we need to deploy people and people have been fabulous. Um, how has the community responded to not having physical access to the library um, and switching to online? I know we mentioned some barriers related to that online sure. access, but the day center exists. You know, so what are how are the community how is the community responding to you know to that? They've absolutely been asking us for curbside delivery, and so we are we are responding. I mean, it took a lot of bandwidth to get the day center up and the call center up. Um, but we're, we're figuring it out. We're watching what other libraries do. Uh, we're lock, looking at that across the whole country. Um, but um, as we have worked um, with the day center and have had to develop operational plans, dealing with personal protective equipment and making sure we have um, safety first, um, it's putting us in a good position now to roll out curbside delivery safely. So I, I think it's all been a process and we may not have moved fast enough that that everybody wishes uh, we would have had curbside, curbside delivery sooner but I think uh, we'll be doing it right and uh, and safely and that I think is important so uh, I, I would say that was probably our number one request from people is to do curbside what about the bookmobile is that still out and about the, it is not there is oh. no way to socially distance on the bookmobile oh so that has been that has been very sad for our because that the, the bookmobile goes places where we also have a vulnerability so we're continuing to look at how do we how do we do this because we don't expect to come back day one you know the day first day we're open we're just open the doors and say we're going to go back to the way it was we don't expect that we're having to we're starting our planning for what does it look like? And I don't necessarily have answers for you today, but those are all conversations that we're gonna have at various levels. Cause I think in some ways it's up to the community to say what they're comfortable with and what they're willing to do. I do expect us to continue to have to do social distancing. And I, I look at some of the services that we provide. We do a lot of support on, with computers. We have people who come in who don't know how to use computers and we help them with it. 
And so it's very hard to do that social distancing. So we're, we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to have to figure it out and uh, we're not ready today, but I am fully confident that my team will come up with great solutions. And we're, we're always happy to borrow from other people who are doing it well. Have you, um, have you all decided on the late fees, if, if that's going to be waived or changed? I know organizations have to figure out how to continue to sustain and that sort of thing. So what, what's going on with, with that? The fees so that? Uh, the library board is committed to figuring out how to go forward. But in this environment, we don't necessarily have an exact plan for how that is going right. to go. Uh, so uh, we're hopeful. Uh, we know that in this new environment, um, economic stability is going to be difficult, and we do not want overdue fines to be a barrier. And so we're going to have to figure it out. But I, I know the library board really believes that every single person um, should have access to library materials, and we just will we'll be working on that. It's still a priority for the library board. Um, what other ways is the library uh, collaborating or helping in the community? I know you mentioned the day center. Um, are there other things that that you can share that the library is doing or that is going to be on deck? Yeah, so uh, we continue to be very active within the Emergency Operations Center and the overall planning for the city. So uh, everything from logistics to planning, um, we have staff members available. Food, stabil food stability is, continues to be a conversation that's happening within the Emergency Operations Center and those conversations are ongoing. Um, so I really, I really, the city, for example, did uh, provide a food drop, a, a box drop of food um, early on. And so we're looking at what that might look like going forward, because we do want everyone to get the resources that they need. And how do we make sure, again, libraries are a lot, of, there's a lot about good information. So how do people get the information uh, to get into this, to get help when they need it? Because part of it is what we understand from this COVID-19, there are a lot of people within our community who've never been, um, who, who've never been in food insecure before, that may have been laid off for the very first time in their lives, and may not know how to navigate. And so, it's going to be really important that uh, people have good information. And I absolutely see the library being part of that role going forward, and just really making sure we're uh, part of how people get that information. That's good info. Yeah, the library is certainly is a resource to the community, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to have to move Skull, my cat. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show him first to the world. <laughs> and he is all over the table right now. I had to move him. So, I, so you know, that's the, that's the uh, caveat of uh, working at home and um, doing that. So, okay, here's the question that I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. What is your what is your favorite taco, Audrey? I hope you like tacos because I'm a taco fanatic. <laughs> I do love tacos. Yay! Yeah. You mean like from what from what restaurant or from oh, just, just in general? Whatever. Yeah, a restaurant in general. What what's your favorite taco? What, which one yeah. do you like? I tell you, my go to taco are the street ta the chicken street tacos at El Sueño. Oh yeah, those are good. I've had those before. They have good yeah. sauces too. Yeah. Very good sauces. Uh, uh, yeah, their pico de gallo is, is my favorite. Um, that's awesome. I love it. Uh, Audrey, so when people need to get these resources or information, where can they go to get to obtain Yeah, them? our website is a great place to start. Um, RPLMN.org is really where people, where we want people to, to start. Perfect. Yep. Thank you so much, Audrey. We appreciate you being on the show. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to Our Town Podcast, the KSMQ public television show. We're so thankful that you're here today, listening in or watching. You can leave us a review if you like what you heard or subscribe on our YouTube channel. Catch up with us on Facebook or Twitter at KSMQ, hashtag Our Town. Tune in next week for more on Our Town.